I'm from a company called Meta Optimize, and uh, my talk is entitled New Developments in Large Data that Have Immediate Application in Industry but You Haven't Heard of Yet. Um, so I'm not going to include any math in this talk. I don't think I have any equation in this talk, but on the other hand, uh, it's still going to be like um, kind of fast paced. So if you are hacking while I'm talking, you'll probably miss something cool. So well, let's start with this question. How do you get a competitive advantage with data, right? Um, so you can use more data, but if you look to the people to your left and to your right, they're probably already using more data, right? So how are you going to beat them? How are you going to get a competitive advantage over them? Well, one way that you can get a competitive advantage with data, besides using more data, is to use better algorithms. Okay, so I'm going to talk about some better algorithms in this talk today. Um, and when big data gives diminishing returns, that's when you should start using better algorithms. Use big data first, but then once you, once you start to plateau, then maybe consider better algorithms. That's my argument. So when should you use better algorithms? Well, I'm a big proponent of if the algorithm is really, really cool, you should use it. <laughs> OK, now, um, I'm a hacker, and yeah, I do like cool algorithms, but we have work to get done, right? Uh, if you have a lot of time on your hands, use cool algorithms? No. Um, you should use better algorithms if they will qualitatively improve your product. Okay? This, is my, this is my business argument right here. Um, so who am I? My name is Joseph Turian. Um, I'm a hacker, born and bred. I've been hacking my entire life. I also hold a PhD uh, in machine learning and natural language processing, and that's what I work on. Um, Meta Optimize, my company, what is it? Uh, optimize the process of optimizing the process. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, um, it's a consultancy. Um, the focus is on large-scale machine learning and natural language processing, uh, and also in particular if there's a need for a well-engineered solution. Uh, you might also have heard of Meta Optimize. I started a Q&A site uh, based in OSCA. It's a Stack Overflow clone. It's a machine learning and natural language processing Q&A site. So if you had a question like, why is Naive Bayes not, not working on this particular data set, you could go on uh, the site and ask. Uh, it's the most active community, it might be the only community of machine learning and natural language processing people on the web. Um, and it gets about a thousand unique visitors a day. It's pretty popular. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, talk about three topics. Uh, deep learning, graph parallelism, and unsupervised semantic parsing. Deep learning. So the opportunity here is machine learning that's large scale, that we can use all sorts of different kinds of data, and, uh, and is just general purpose. It's not a very task-specific approach, uh, but it's also really accurate. Okay? And so deep learning, well, when, when artificial intelligence started in uh, 1950, people, people made these like wild claims that, oh yeah, give us like 10 or 20 years and we'll have like flying robots that can talk. And basically that the, these, these overstated claims put a bad taste in everybody's mouth when artificial intelligence didn't live up to the promises and live up to the hype. And for that reason, people in machine learning, well, first of all, they, they rebranded as machine learning. And second of all, they started working on um, techniques and benchmarks that, um, that, that didn't necessarily, um, didn't necessarily like, attack this goal of artificial intelligence. Or how, how good can we do with a linear model? We know a linear model is not going to be powerful enough for artificial intelligence, but it still is good on certain tasks. So let, let's explore a linear model, for example, right? Um, but recently, there's been a trend, OK, maybe, maybe we can actually start trying to solve artificial intelligence and making like a real effort at it, right? This is, this is where deep learning comes in, OK? Um, so, so natural intelligence, as we know, it works, right? Natural intelligence allows us to collaborate and compete effectively. Um, whereas artificial intelligence, as I said, has not lived up to the, the promises that have been made, right? Uh, these, these are some robots. Um, so, so where does intelligence come from? Uh, intelligence comes from knowledge. And so how, do you, how, does a, how does a machine get knowledge, right? Um, so what you do is you get a bunch of people, and you put them in a data center, and they start entering knowledge, right? Well, no. Uh, that will take a while. So knowledge comes from learning, right? 
that's how humans acquire knowledge, is through learning. And that's hopefully how a machine could also get knowledge. Uh, so statistical learning theory, new multidisciplinary field, numerous applications in medicine, finance, uh, music, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So what we're interested in here is not memorization, which is something that machines can do, but we're interested in actually learning in a way that our knowledge can generalize, right? Generalize to new circumstances and opportunities. And uh, so, how do we build a learning machine, right? Uh, I'm going to show you a deep architecture. What you have here, uh, this is uh, the input to the machine is uh, raw pixels, right? And let's take these raw pixels, pass them up a layer, and then do feature extraction over these pixels, right? So what we might do is we might just do uh, stroke, like edge detection, right? Then let's take these edges, let's pass them up, let's do another layer of feature extraction. Maybe like higher up, we start, getting, we start extracting shapes. And then we take these shapes and we pass them and we do another layer of feature extraction maybe and start getting faces, right? So as you go up, up this hierarchy of feature extraction, you go from a representation that's very primitive and low level, which is pixels, and then you get a progressively more abstract and high level representation out of it. So this is a deep architecture. And by comparison, a shallow architecture would be one in which there are two or fewer intermediate layers of feature extraction, okay? So, so, so what's the motivation? Uh, why, why do we want a deep architecture? Well, like, let, let me just work through some intuitions, right? Uh, computer programs in general are deep, right? We have a main routine which can call a subroutine, which can call sub-subroutines, et cetera, et cetera. And you're, in general, using like arbitrary levels of abstraction when you're writing code. Uh, on the other hand, if I were to say, oh, you, you only can use uh, two levels deep of abstraction, you could, you could write whatever code you wanted, you just do a lot of code duplication, right? So your code would not actually be as compact. Um, and you know, if we look at circuits, there's arguments from circuit theory that, that, says, uh, that says you can represent any mathematical function with a, a, a shallow circuit, but it's gonna be a really wide circuit, it's gonna be exponentially big. Right? So you can't represent things compactly, necessarily, if it's going to be shallow. So with depth, you can actually represent things more compactly. All right. So I've argued that fat architectures, that you can get these really non-compact fat architectures with shallow architectures. W what's wrong with them? Well, the more parameters you have, the more likely you are to overfit, because then you're, you just have something that's more complicated to represent a simple underlying phenomenon. Right? Um, via Occam's razor, choose the simplest explanation. That suffices. Um, so what are other motivations for deep architectures, deep learning? Um, so if we look at the brain, to the best of our knowledge, uh, the brain is a deep architecture. Uh, for example, the visual cortex, uh, to, to like, cur current, current uh, Current neuroscience says that, okay, so the retina receives these raw pixels, passes them V1 area, which shows edge detection. Uh, V2 area takes these edge detectors, edges that have been detected and has primitive shapes. Uh, it, V4 has higher level visual abstractions. This is pretty similar to the, the artificial neural network that I showed you earlier for vision. Um, so deep architectures are awesome because they're compact. Uh, the problem is, and, and people have been interested in deep architectures and deep learning for a while, it was just that no one knew how to train them. No one knew how to train them until 2006. Uh, in 2006, there was a breakthrough, and, um, and I, so, th so I found out about this right as, right, as I, um, right as I submitted my thesis. I read this tech report, it hadn't been published yet, and I was like, this deep learning stuff sounds really, really cool. Um, so, so it uses, it, there, were th there were some techniques that they used to train deep architectures. Uh, first of all, Im improving the signal to noise ratio when you're training. Um, second of all, using this thing called unsupervised learning, which allows you to use uh, just a lot of input, even if there has been no annotation that's been added to it. And, uh, and creating layers of features one at a time. That was, that was the last trick. So these, these three gentlemen uh, are sort of like the fathers of this, this discipline. Uh, Jan LeCun in New York City, Jeff Hinton in Toronto, Yashua Benjo in Montreal. Um, actually, I did my postdoc with Yashua just because I found this stuff so fascinating. Um, and and it's, been, it's been a major success. These guys were right. Um, now, 
deep learning is kind of like what SVMs were five or ten years ago. It's the hot new topic in machine learning. Um, and it's made sort of state-of-the-art breakthroughs in a lot of different domains. It's also the government's really interested in it uh, in America. And uh, just the, the community, uh, the, the, just there are more and more papers on it every year. So as I said, the opportunity here is large-scale machine learning. I'm talking in the scale of like billions of examples. Um, but that we can use all sorts of data. We can use audio, we can use images, we can use text. And it's, it's really general purpose, but it's also highly accurate. Okay? Um, so here's an application of deep learning. Well, when we're talking about, I'm going to talk about semantic hashing, and it's a fast semantic search, right? Uh, so what's wrong with keyword search? Um, so if we were to search for tweets on Hadoop, Right? We would miss the following tweets because that keyword, Hadoop, is not present. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong, keyword search works great, especially if you, you use tricks like, like query expansion, stuff like that. But nonetheless, we still don't have good semantic search. Okay? Um, so we miss relevant results. And I, you, you, may, you may know this data structure, it's the, the basis of most IR systems, it's an inverted index. Okay? Um, and this is what's used in keyword search. Uh, but hashing is another technique that we can use for search. And what we do is we take a document and we just map it to uh, an, ad an address space. And then whatever documents are nearby it, those are the ones that are retrieved. So it's also the, the ha a hash representation can be really compact. Um, if we had billions of images just to store them, would be 40 terabytes, but if we represent each one as a 64-bit hash, we can compress it down. The index will only be 8 gigs, which means a single machine could actually index a billion images using hashing, semantic hashing. Um, in fact, people have done that. Um, so dumb hashing, not, not, not that, uh, the, to use that term in a, a deprecatory way, because I actually really like a lot of these techniques. They're just not data-driven, right? Um, hashing, uh, some cool hashing techniques are random projections, the count min sketch, bloom filters, locality sensing of hashing, right? Recently, there's been a trend towards smarter hashing techniques that are data-driven, okay? And um, so semantic hashing is essentially when we combine a data-driven hash with deep learning, okay? So like, remember the, uh, the deep architecture I was showing you before? So here I have a deep architecture that learns compression, right? I take 200, uh, 200 dimensions in the input, I compress it to 50, I compress it to 50, I compress it to another 32, okay? And then from that 32, I want to be able to reconstruct 500, 500, and then 2,000. So what I'm actually doing is I'm just, like, feeding in data and all my, my training criterion is that I want the 32 bits to be in as an effective compression technique as possible, that when I decompress, I've reconstructed the input as losslessly as possible. That's it, okay? And if I do that, well, first of all, let me compare this to some traditional techniques. If we were talking about like TF-IDF, um, that just, just a standard information retrieval technique, um, that, that would be just like not actually doing any feature extraction over the raw input. Um, if we were to do LSA or LDA or LSA, LSI, latent semantic indexing, if you've heard of that, that would be like one level of feature extraction. If we, if we actually do something deeper, then the idea is that hopefully you can extract higher level semantic representations. Um, so if we were to just throw in some, uh, some documents, um, what, and, and then compress it down to two dimensions, it turns out that it's actually able to discriminate between the categories. It's not even given the category data, right? It's just like it, 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 the, the things that are similar in topic get clustered closer together, and the categories or the colors are added later on, but the, the hashing never actually knows about it. Uh, this is from a, a Reuters data set on different news topics. Um, so, so the opportunity here is semantic search, this general purpose, fast and compact, right? We, can, we, can just, we don't have to do it on text. We can just throw in images. People have done it on images. You can use videos or audio. Uh, it's fast. Uh, you can index uh, a billion documents using 100 cores in a few weeks. But what's really fast is the lookup time, right? Because you're, 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 you're doing something that's, you're basically doing hash, right? That, that's, um, that is uh, constant time. And um, 
it, it, well, it's not going to be strictly constant, but it's, it's going to be fast, right? Uh, three milliseconds for a million documents, and it scales definitely sublinearly, like way sublinearly. Um, and the most exciting thing is that they're really compact, right? As I said before, uh, a single machine, you could actually index a billion images, which I think is pretty cool. So my prediction, smart hashing will revolutionize search. That's prediction number two. Uh, how am I doing in time? What? Oh, great. Um, graph parallelism. So um, if you've been following this whole wacky NoSQL thing, uh, you might have noticed that people are actually working on graph databases. Uh, for example, Neo4j, that, that's the most uh, popular one, if I'm not mistaken. But there are a handful of others. So the, the interesting opportunity with graph-based parallelism is that we might be able to scale a lot of sophisticated machine learning algorithms, which means that we can use larger data sets and get higher accuracy. Um, all the motivations for using big data in the first place. So there are, when we talk about like um, some usual machine learning algorithms, uh, things like Gibbs sampling, matrix factorization, expectation maximization, lasso, these all have graph-like data dependencies. Um, and if we try and do these algorithms in MapReduce, um, so Carlos Guestrin, he actually calls it map abuse. It's like fitting, a, 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 I guess, a square peg in a round hole. Like, you can put these algorithms in the MapReduce framework. You just don't get the expected scaling properties. Uh, and th that can be problematic, right? Um, so the idea is that there are too many graph-like dependencies in cer certain sophisticated machine learning algorithms to effectively MapReduce them. Um, and if we were to have a, a parallelism abstraction that's slightly lower level than MapReduce, but still handles, you know, s still handles like all the, the nitty gritty uh, details. Um, but but we're operating at the level of graph-based dependencies. Then we can start scaling machine learning algorithms effectively. Um, out of Google, there's a project called Pregel. I think there there's there might be there might be another more implementation, but there's definitely an Erlang implementation right now called uh, Phoebus. Uh, also, out of CMU, this group um, worked on a project called Graph Lab. They released the source code for this, and it's basically their implementation of a graph-based parallel, um, parallel framework. Um, just to plug my site again, the Q&A site, um, I, was, I was actually asking about Graph Lab because no one had actually talked about it yet. Um, and and the, the authors were going to be talking about it at a conference, but I hadn't seen any discussion on the web. Um, so I asked about it, and actually one of the authors of the paper came on and talked about it on my site. Um, so I don't know, I'm just trying to reiterate that this is a useful resource if you're interested in machine learning and natural language processing. Okay, so the, the opportunity here is better scaling of sophisticated machine learning algorithms. Um, all the reasons that you would use MapReduce apply here, except that we can, with, with a graph-based framework, there are more algorithms that we, we could actually scale. So my prediction is MapReduce. For simpler algorithms, um, um, many workflows that you'll be familiar with uh, will fit into MapReduce. But for more sophisticated machine learning, we might need graph parallelism. In fact, we probably do. Um, unsupervised semantic parsing, last, last topic I'm going to go into. So what's the opportunity here? What we want is to take a bunch of text, shove it in the computer, and have it just, just, just understand it, essentially. Um, the applications are numerous if we can have natural language understanding. Uh, question answering, natural language search, spam generation and or spam detection, uh, knowledge extraction, etc. So he, 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 here's going to be like a running example. What is, what is IL2 control, right? Well, I, 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 don't, I don't know. I, uh, I don't study that sort of thing. What would I do if I want to find out? I'd probably read a document, and I would say, oh, OK. The answer is the DEX mediated L kappa B alpha induction because it was inhibited by IL2. 
right? But to do that, I would actually need to know the control and inhibited mean the same thing, or actually the opposite. Um, so, so the challenge here is that the same meaning can be expressed many different ways in language. Uh, IL-2, protein IL-2, IL-4 protein, etc. Um, so semantic parsing, what we're talking about here is grokking, um, grokking text into a variation in specific format, right? Um, Microsoft buys power set, we could, buys is a relation that, uh, that, uh, that, that buys is a relation that operates over the actors Microsoft and power set. All right, so where does intelligence come from? I asked this before, intelligence comes from knowledge. What we're interested here is knowledge, knowledge extraction, okay? How are we gonna do it? Uh, we also probably want an ontology that tells us, okay, well, induce and enhance and trigger and augment and upregulate, these mean the same thing. Uh, these are all clusters of meanings and these are all types of regulation, okay? So how do we extract knowledge from text? Um, you get a bunch of PhDs and you get them to write a grammar, right? It looks something like this, no. Okay, so the manual approach to extracting knowledge is costly, ineffective, and inflexible. And if you've been, if you've been following so far, y you'll see that like in general, my style of approach is to try and use a lot of data and apply something that's really general and task in specific and domain in specific. Um, so going back to this original challenge of same meaning can be encoded in many different ways. Um, so, so the challenge is you know, if, if we were to try and come up with a grammar, grammar um, you know, we, we don't want something that's too domain specific, essentially, okay? So we want knowledge extraction, it's large scale, that's open domain, automatic, and a complete end-to-end -end system, okay? And we also want to learn ontology, too. So, uh, I'm gonna skip this example. Um, so what, what we don't want to do is like the old school ontology induction approach or learning approach of first we induce an ontology and then we start populating all the all the all the 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 the, the nodes in the ontology. Um, so we we don't want to use something heuristic. We don't want to use existing knowledge bases because then they won't necessarily generalize to other domains. If we were to use, for example, like DBpedia, that's cool, but there's no DBpedia for chemistry, for example. Um, we also don't want to do these two tasks in isolation. We want to do induction and population at the same time because then we're going to actually get better accuracy. Um, so there's this really cool technique by Poon and Dominguez. Um, and it, it jointly does ontology induction, uh, ontology population, knowledge extraction. And I think this is a really cool work. It's one of these works that you read it, you, you, you start reading it, and you're like, wait, like, you're really like trying to solve this problem of natural language understanding. Like, in NLP, like, most people aren't trying to do that. Most like a lot of the time we lose sight of this, this goal of our field of full natural language understanding. Most people are working, and for good reason, on, on very specific sub-problems. But when, when Poon and Dominguez published this approach, it's just like, it's really ambitious, and it's really elegant, and it also works effectively. Um, it doesn't solve natural language understanding, but it does move us one step closer. And I think, I think that's really cool. Um, so here's the intuition. All right, so what we wanna do is we wanna cluster syntactic or lexical variations on the same meaning, okay? Uh, we want there to be uh, relations like buys, and so buys, uh, we could have buys, acquires, someone's purchase of, uh, Microsoft, there might be different ways that we could say Microsoft, et cetera, okay? So let, let's start with a corpus, because essentially what we do is we get a corpus of text, and we just shove it in the machine, and we want it to learn, okay? So how does it learn from this? First thing it does is it just identifies all the, all the words 
they're the same, and it clusters them, right? Microsoft, the blue cluster, uh, PowerSet, the green cluster, and buys the red cluster, right? So from here, we can, actually, we can actually start making inferences, right? Since we know that Microsoft has a certain relationship with PowerSet, namely that Microsoft is the buyer of PowerSet, then if we see Microsoft and PowerSet in other sentences, it stands to reason that buys means the same thing as S's purchase of, right? Or for that matter, that A, A buys B is the same thing as B is acquired by A, okay? So this is how it starts like actually uh, inducing the meaning. Then we can actually keep going because now we have more red. So we say, okay, well, since Microsoft buys PowerSet, then semantic search engine PowerSet is the same thing as PowerSet. Or for that matter, the Redmond soft software giant is the same thing as Microsoft. Okay? And this is how it starts inducing meaning. Um, so it, it gets clusters and compositions, essentially. And when you do this, it turns out that actually pretty, pretty, pretty darn good at extracting no knowledge um, if, we're, if we're going to start doing something like question answering, right? Um, the author of this paper, in fact, I think he told me that he had, he had no, no, no knowledge of biochemistry, so it's kind of a fun challenge because he had it answer biochemical questions, 2,000 different questions. Um, and so... Compared to competing methods, uh, some of which you might actually have heard of, like Dirt or Text Runner, um, his was able to answer a lot more questions uh, just by reading the text. Most of the time, the, they just weren't able to extract the knowledge from the documents. Uh, and also, he had so he had five times as many correct answers as uh, as his like the nearest competitor and the highest accuracy. So the opportunity here is. Being able to read text and understand them um, in a domain in specific way. As I said, he wasn't doing anything specific with bio, biochemistry. He just, just, just shoved the data into his system and it worked. Okay? So, um, I'm going to, I'm going to, oh great. So I'm going to go back to uh, my, my last prediction. Automated knowledge extraction will become widespread and will be used in a lot more systems. So let me, let me go over my take home points. Uh, when big data gives diminishing returns, you need better algorithms. But you should only use better algorithms if they will qualitatively improve your product. Uh, I said this several times. Intelligence comes from knowledge, and knowledge comes from learning. And here are my predictions. Um, smart hashing will revolutionize search. Graph-based parallelism will be used for sophisticated machine learning. And automated knowledge extraction will become widespread. So thank you to these people. I took some of the slides from them. That's my talk. Thanks. Thank you, Joseph. And we have 10 minutes more for the discussion session. So are there questions? Any questions from the audience? <laughs> Over there. Uh, the part of your presentation where you basically showed a little bit about how it uh, would build, on, build an ontology, uh, I noticed that basically you were making suppositions about verb tenses and that kind of thing. So I imagine that is built in as part of the model before you begin. Yeah, so the, the one thing that's, that's uh, so it, it takes as input um, uh, syntactic parses, okay? So it, it's only going to be as good as the underlying syntactic parser. Fair enough. Fair enough. More questions? Right at the column. Uh, I throw a troublesome question in whenever the room goes quiet. Um, I have a passing familiarity with MDS approaches for clustering. Um, can you comment at all? Um, so that's a dimensionality reduction in another MDS. word. MDS. Yes. Okay. 
Okay. Um, can you comment on the relationship between your clustering algorithms and dimensionality reduction algorithms, just to give me another starting point? Thank you. Sure. Um, so they're not, they're not my algorithms, by the way. Um, so, um, so MDS is, is basically a dim dimensionality reduction technique. Um, so, so deep learning you can think of as uh, like iterated steps of dimensionality reduction, right? Uh, you don't actually need to do dimensionality oh. reduction. You could do feature extraction, keep it just as wide and not actually compress it. Um, but if you do compress it, it's, it's similar to a dimensionality reduction technique with multiple steps. So, uh, what, could, uh, yeah. what, what would you say is the advantage of doing this in multiple steps as opposed to um, a single step dimensionality reduction algorithm? Because the theory is still that you find the minimum number of dimensions that usefully expresses your data. Why not go straight from 2000 to 32 using Glimmer or something like that? Mm -hmm. So, so the, the advantage of using multiple steps is that, um, that you can actually represent uh, more powerful transformations between the input and the compressed space. That, that's essentially it. The, 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 the dimensionality reduction can be more powerful, essentially. Okay. Um, do you have any empirical results regarding um, better recall through semantic hashing? Um, I'd have to I'd have to look it up. So so um, in the original semantic hashing work, he compares TFIDF to to the semantic hashing approach, but I forget the exact numbers. So, so I don't, I don't want to make a, a, a quote right now, but I could send you the paper. I could talk to you about it afterwards. Um, <clears throat> does the, um, if you're using semantic hashing for topic classification and clustering like you showed, mm -hmm. um, does that deal gracefully with polysemous words or do you remove so much information that you lose the ability to disambiguate them? Yeah, I mean, in, in fact, that, that would be one of the um, simplest things that should be able to implement um, insofar as, you know, if the word Apple appears in a document um, and there, there are a lot of co-occurring words like grove and stand and juice, um, then, then we wouldn't necessarily assign it to a topic that would correspond to computers or technology. So it, it should be able to detect that, yeah. More questions? And I should say there's code available for most of the things that I talked about. Uh, there's code available for, I think, everything except semantic hashing. Uh, actually, that was my second question, which was what are the typical hashing algorithms that are used that give you that kind of locality? Um, you basically said, okay, you just throw it through this hash, and here you wind up in a space, but picking the right algorithm is the only way you're going to get that space. And so I was curious as to what work had been done. Right, so the, the original approach um, is a purely unsupervised approach, and all it does is compress. It, all it does is try and learn codes that it can uncompress correctly, and merely by doing that, things that end up things that are similar end up uh, getting nearby codes. Um, but you can also add some some annotated information, so that you know if I if I if I have labels, for example, for certain documents, then documents with the same labels, I can insist that their hashes be nearby. Good, done. Thank you, Joseph.